Field is here to talk to us. I got to hear some of his uh, politics when he was running for Congress last couple years ago. And um, I appreciate what you have sort of built into your platform, uh, have sort of built it out of like women's freedom. And uh, there's this distinction in your work between freedom as a choice and uh, freedom as a choice plus what's included, uh, plus a fair representation of uh, the content among which you choose. The, the, the choice part matters as much as what is in what you're picking between. Uh, so, for example, freedom uh, as choice is like giving a vegetarian the choice between chicken, fish, and beef. And saying like, oh, you have three choices, you're free. Uh, freedom uh, as choice between a fair representation, as you kind of articulate, in the content. So freedom as a choice with fair representation uh, in the content, and what you choose is giving that same vegetarian choice between chicken, tofu, and hummus. Both of them have three options. You have three choices. One of them is uh, you have a choice that confirms who you are, and the other one is a choice that, ali that al alienates you from who mm -hmm. you want to choose yourself into. So I appreciate that you kind of articulate that in your politics. Um, talk about what you see as the inadequacies of sort of the current choice uh, discourse and how you think your platform enables women to have a more robust exercise of freedom, not, not merely choices among things, but, uh, but choices among things that represent <coughs> I mean, when we're talking about freedom in terms of self-determination, <clears throat> you know, we're not just talking about choice because choice does not involve self-determination in that the options among which you tr choose are not necessarily determined by your will, nor do you determine the nature of your agency when you wield choice, the faculty of choice, which in a sense you have by nature and which you have to have in order to make any choices and act in any way. But when you interact with others, you can then enter into practices where you exercise rights, which are choices that are of such a character that they can only be made by enabling others to engage in the same sort of choice. And that involves all the participants giving themselves a new character as bearer of rights of different sorts. And I, I think the totality of rights which form a kind of integrated system uh, is something one has to think about to make sense of mm -hmm. rights in general and I think also issues pertaining to women's health. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and I appreciate how you, how you talk about the, the sort of creation of content as something that is a joint venture, that we make content for each other that is either enab enabling freedom and rights for other people or is alienating. Uh, so, I specifically want to talk about three things um, that uh, you ha have had on your platform the last two years ago when you ran for Congress and now as you're running for Senate. Uh, so, sexual harassment at work uh, as raised by the Me Too movement. You have some thoughts on that. Yeah. I would love to hear. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the Me Too movement and its unveiling of the magnitude and character of sexual harassment at work hasn't really been explored in a way that sufficiently acknowledges what lies behind the tremendous impunity of the perpetrators of sexual harassment in the workplace, as well as the tremendous difficulty the victims have in order to defend themselves and, and in a sense, uh, have a remedy. And the Me Too movement has exposed how you know, we're talking about something that pertains to people of any gender. But on the other hand, I think it's uh, at, least, at least anecdotally true, I don't have statistics, that the majority of victims are women uh, for reasons that I want to talk about in, in due course. But I think the big elephant in the room that is not properly acknowledged, that really um, pervades the situation in which sexual harassment is taking place in America is the fear of firing. Yeah. Yeah. And in America, the fear of firing yeah. 
has five distinctive features um, that are not to be had in every, every developed nation. And the first feature, which alas is to be found in most developed nations, is the fact that we accept un unemployment. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, you know, one can consider unemployment to be something inevitable if we let the market run its merry course. And so far as competition has winners and losers, it requires firms to continually modify their production and marketing processes, which require roiling the labor market in various ways. But we have chosen to accept something that has a remedy that I will discuss in due course. Um, but to the extent that we allow there to be unemployment, people find themselves in a position where if they object to sexual harassment or other sorts of things at the workplace, they face the prospect of being without a job and all that that incurs. And that need not be the case. A second aspect of the fear of firing that pertains to America to a degree that it does not in any other developed nation is that we have tied to our job essential benefits, at least to some jobs, that, in, that should not be tied to employment or, or job history and are not in many other countries. So that, for example, now if you are fearing firing, not only are you left potentially without a job and an income, but you're left without health care, you're left without decent retirement benefits. So it becomes a matter of life and death and old age indigence. And that ramps up the, the way to which the perpetrators of various kinds of malfeasance in the workplace can act with impunity and victims are terrified of blowing the whistle. Now there's a third factor, which again takes an extreme form in the United States. And that is when you're in the workplace, in about 94% of the time in the private sector and 10.5% all around, you find yourself utterly, unalo utterly alone without any resources to rely upon the solidarity of your fellow employees. And what I'm talking about is the degree of no union representation in American workplaces, which is at an all-time low, at least in terms of our lifetimes and my lifetime, probably the oldest person here. And uh, what that means is that you do not have any of the resources that unionization and solidarity with employees can provide you, which means for most Americans, you are in a situation of being subject to being fired at will, where no grounds whatsoever have to be brought into play to be able to get away with it, which again is the third factor, allowing those who have power in the workplace to act with impunity, and those who are subject to their will to be under great difficulty in resisting it. Fourthly, in America, and I'm afraid to say in pretty much most other countries, you do not have the guarantee of having the legal resources to fight the harassment that you face. And although our Bill of Rights provides a guarantee of uh, representation in criminal cases, we know that the way it's implemented gives those who cannot pay for their dream team, they are subject to poorly paid uh, court-appointed lawyers or legal legal aid lawyers who have ridiculously high caseloads and little resources to engage in any kind of investigation. That's the bad part of it. But also, even worse, is we have no guarantee of legal representation in civil cases. And usually in these cases, although there can be a criminal element, there's also a civil element. And if you don't have legal representation, which in America, about 87% of the people who get themselves involved in civil cases do not have representation, you lose 90% of the time. So that's another factor. The fourth factor that makes the fear of firing so intense and, again, allows for the impunity and the inability to resist. And then there's a fifth factor. Um, I'm not sure, frankly, to what degree uh, this 
is to be found in other legal systems. I suspect it is not allowed to operate in the way it does in our system. But we allow for non-disclosure agreements. Yeah. <laughs> and non-disclosure agreements clearly, at least I, I think, violate a basic feature of court procedures and due process, which is that we're dealing with something that is of a public character. It's about justice. It's about something that should be known to the public, just as legal proceedings should, in principle, be public, and everyone should have access without cost to transcripts and the like. Well, we allow for these kind of non-disclosure agreements, which obviously serve the interests of the perpetrators yeah. of this kind of situation. But I think we have to keep all of these things in mind if we really want to eliminate as much as possible or ensure that justice is done in regard to everything raised by the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. So how do we do it? Well, first of all, we get rid of unemployment. It can't be done by the market, but it can be done by public intervention. And it needs to be done on, an, on a nationwide scale. It needs to be done on a federal way by a federal job guarantee, which ensures that if you lose your job or can't find work in the private sector, the government will put you to work, and put you to work at a fair wage. That is not just a poverty living wage of $15 an hour, which according to the government's own statistics is a, an invitation to both poverty and homelessness. It needs to start at $20 and up and be adjusted with the rising prosperity of the nation. Keep pace with that so that all boats rise. And that will do much to mitigate the fear of firing. But secondly, uh, we have to, as I mentioned, separate all benefits from employment. We have to ensure that health care is treated as a right. There are various ways of doing it. Uh, I think in the, in the United States context, the easiest, cheapest, most cost-effective way, fairest way, is a single-payer health insurance policy uh, with no co-pays, no deductibles, covering everything. Uh, that is of, of essential um, requirement. Physical, mental, dental, long-term care, et cetera. So that one doesn't have to worry about dying, getting sick and dying, and your dependents dying and getting sick if you lose your job. And the same thing with, with retirement benefits. You know, we should not have to depend upon pensions from our workplace. We need to ensure that those who are disabled or those who are retired have a replacement income, so to speak, that's at least equal to the fair minimum wage, which if you think of $20 an hour is $41,600 a year per person. That too will alleviate the fear of firing. But then of course we have to ensure that people have the legal resources to fight for their rights and, and in particular their rights in civil cases, which are of crucial importance. And that can be done by what I, I would call legal care for all on the model of a single-payer health insurance program, where we have a subsidized national legal insurance program covers all the costs of personal, criminal, and civil advice and legal representation. We can negotiate as a nation with legal practitioners to keep costs down. And this and all the other um, policies can be fairly funded. And what I, what I mean by fair funding if we're not going to rely upon enlarging the money supply or deficit spending would be taxation that falls on those whose opportunities will be least effective, which is to say the wealthiest Americans. And given the extreme income inequality and wealth inequality in America, it's very feasible to fund all of these ventures by focusing on the top 1% and perhaps the top 10% and providing total federal tax relief to the bottom 90 percent and the figures will substantiate that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah you've done a lot of math on this yeah. as well i'm you know you are the first person i have ever heard one, one last thing yeah, yeah, go ahead. the fifth point regarding non-disclosure agreements yeah. those have to be banned entirely mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Trade not secrets. what's that trade secrets i can't have you spilling all of my beans well yeah. that that's the other side I mean, in addition to um non-disclosure agreements, you have on the other hand these, um, I'm trying to remember the term, these agreements employees 
are now being forced to have where they can't work in the same industry no, for certain no, no, So you would get rid of all of those? Yeah. Hmm. They favor white people. Oh, I'm, I'm for it. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just seeing how far you're going to go. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, no, I mean, look, there are copyright laws, et cetera, right. that can be respected, yeah. et cetera. In a nation of laws, I'm surprised. So two years ago when you were running for Congress and you were talking about a legal care for all system, yeah. I was just shocked that I had never heard that before in a nation of laws. Like we're a nation of like, like that's our thing is like we have laws and like, and, and I was just like, why is this not a thing? Um, you know, so I forgot one other yeah, part of the solution. Let me say that before we get back to this. Mm -hmm. We have to remedy the disempowerment of employees at the workplace. And the NLRB procedures of having to sign up a certain number of workers yeah. by cards, it's, it's, it's completely ineffective. So what we need are two things to, so to speak, level the playing field between employers and employers and make it possible for people to not be subject to firing at will. And one is that in every enterprise that does not have union organization have to be automatic elections for union representation. So we have 100% union, unionization in all workplaces with multiple employees, including part-timers and gig economy and so-called contract employees. And in addition to that, we need to transform corporations from within and ensure that the board of directors have half their members be selected from non-managerial employees who vote for their peers, which has been done in certain European countries. And I think that, that will change the dynamics within the employment situation for the better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but I think the point you, you raised is, is pretty striking. I know of no other candidate mm -hmm. or anyone I've never who's heard pushing of this idea of legal care for all, but it seems to me a, a very obvious and mm -hmm. affordable way of mm -hmm. being part of what's required to allow law to be something that is not determined by money and where we can really all be equal. And so the, you know, the gendered aspect of, of how much these policies impact the lives of women and how, how you know, draw that a little clearer for, for lay people like me uh, in terms of the, the impact on women, the, the freedom that this enables for them to be able to have legal care for issues, be, be yeah, so it, could you draw that a little clearer? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, For the little it, people like me in the room. <laughs> I mean, if you are subject to things that involve civil wrongs, and I think sexual harassment, as we know, um, also involves a criminal aspect. Mm -hmm. And if we think about it in terms of women's health, it involves physical injury. Of course, it involves psychological mm -hmm. injury and stress, which takes a toll that in many respects can be greater than any, any, any physical side of things. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's not, it's not enough to ensure that everyone has access, which I also have to have, to healthcare of all sorts, to deal with the, uh, the repercussions of sexual harassment. But you need to have the legal resources mm -hmm. to be able to fight for your rights. Yeah. And, and the cases that have come up in the Me Too uh, movement you know, have often focused on people who are under the glare of publicity and whom a certain kind of public shaming mm -hmm. can be made use of. But obviously, the vast majority of cases take place completely under the radar, mm -hmm. where you do need legal resources to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And as we know, the perpetrators are ordinarily going to have much greater resources mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. defend themselves than you have. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I very much appreciate the, the, what you're tying together, the, the economic resources, the legal resources, you know, that it, it's uh, systematic and complete and, and in what you would need to actually prosecute cases and actually be free to not, if I lose my job, then I can't afford it if I, um, you know. Uh, was there a question? No. No. Um, so that, that brings us to sort of uh, the panel before was talking a little bit about reproductive uh, freedom, and um, I, you have a lot of thoughts on sort of what that actually looks like, so I'd love yeah. for you to talk about sort of your. I mean, how you obviously. You know, the, the opposition, so supposed opposition between pro-choice and pro-life uh, positions has been used and uh, 
used for all sorts of, obviously, um, uh, political, um, political positions that are really not dealing with this issue alone. But it's been used to raise a lot of capital. And uh, you know, I just was at a meeting on Monday with some union members of a building trades um, in Savannah who told me that of their 500 plus members, none of them would ever vote for a Democrat. Um, first of all, because the Democrats don't do anything for labor, but also because of issues like guns and choice and the like. Um, now, I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that the pro-choice movement, I'm sorry, the pro-life movement that focuses on banning abortion uh, is not really pro-life because obviously if abortion is banned, it goes underground and fetuses continue to be destroyed and many women will end up being destroyed or maimed in the process, particularly poor people who don't have access to things. On the other hand, you don't have reproductive freedom if you just have the right to abortion. First of all, you can have the right to abortion and you don't have the resources to pay for it or there, you don't have a place to go for it, right? Mm -hmm. But more importantly, you don't have reproductive freedom if you have unwanted pregnancies. Mm -hmm. And secondly, if you can't have the children you want to have mm -hmm. because you yes. are fearful that you don't have mm -hmm. the kind of economic security mm -hmm. and the structures in place for balancing work and family that will allow you to have the children you want and pursue things um, and, and pursue the rest of your life as you would like. And you know, if you ask yourself, well, uh, why are we in a situation where people have unwanted pregnancies? Well, of course, they don't have access to the kind of health care and uh, contraceptives and day after pills and pregnancy screening, et cetera, prenatal care, whatever. Um, that they would need to escape much of the uh, unwanted pregnancies. Of course, that also applies to sexual education in schools and the like. Mm, yes. um, on the other side, people are not able to have the children they want because, first of all, they don't have any guaranteed job awaiting them. They suffer from poverty wages, housing, medical care, education, higher education, mm -hmm. um, have costs that are far outstripping uh, any increases in wages for most people. And in addition, we lag behind almost every other developed nation in not having paid leave guaranteed to people. We have no public system of child care or elder care. And we don't have child allowances which mean that it's, it's really very hard to have the children you want. So what's a child allowance? What? What is a child allowance? Well, that would be something where every, let's say, parent or custodian who's caring for children will get a certain amount of payment, mm. which would cover the, cost, the additional cost of having a child. Because obviously, you know, your income is not going to suffice if you have other Dependence, so you have to pay for it. And of course, that increases all sorts of costs, um, both housing, food, furniture, uh, educational costs, legal costs, etc. So in a sense, if, if you want to think about a remedy to this other side of things, of course, one remedy in ensuring that people can have an abortion and have that right enforced is to, to, to make it available, to have a single-payer health insurance program that will cover all of that. But in addition, uh, that would also provide the day after pill, contraceptives, etc., cetera, uh, that would allow unwanted pregnancies to drop to a humanly possible minimum. And on the other hand, if you provide people, any parent and women in particular, with guaranteed employment at a fair wage, mm -hmm. if they're disabled, give them comparable uh, replacement income. Of course, we have to, at the same time, balance work and family in ways that we have not in this country. 
we have to have paid family leave. I, I, I would suggest paid parental leave of at least nine months when a newborn enters the world. Uh, we also have to have public free childcare and elder care. Because we, we all know that, uh, and this, this is crucial to women because women make up 83% of single parents with dependents to care for. And by, by three quarters, they make up the, the family members who care for elders. So we need also public elder care. And we need child allowances. And according to government figures, you need $900 on average to meet the additional costs of having a child. A month. A month, a month. And, and all these things, I think, should be considered as matters of right, which will make it possible for people to be able to have children when they want to have children, not suffer unwanted pregnancies. And so it really turns out that when you realize reproductive freedom in these respects, which are fundamental to it, you end up being more pro-life than any pro-life movement that wants to curtail reproductive freedom. Because you really reduce abortions to the humanly possible minimum. And this is something I think can be pointed out to the pro-life movement, which is trying to weapon, well, which, which you know, various political forces are, are attempting to weaponize, to use to undermine rights in general. How'd that, go, how'd that go over with the union trades? I didn't actually get into a discussion. <laughs> oh, okay. I, didn't, I didn't have that. And since in my last political outing, I never made it past the Democratic primary. I didn't really have a, a chance to deal with this. But I think, I think it can be. I, I think it's also a mistake to think that the argument has ended when one points out that any human being has exclusive right to the use of their own body. Because that, I mean, you're really preaching to the choir if you think that ends the issue concerning abortion. Because Catholics and evangelic who are, you know, against abortions do not have to deny that a woman or any other person, now that slavery has been abolished, have exclusive ownership of their own body. But with any kind of property, you don't have the right to use it in ways that uh, undermine the rights of others. The real question for Catholics and evangelicals is whether the fetus counts as an entity with rights. But I think you can circumvent an argument over that issue in this way, by pointing out you are really being more pro-life than they can possibly be, and that there is no inherent opposition between women's reproductive freedom and being pro-life. Because this is what reduces abortion to a minimum. And I think that, that is something that can undermine the weaponization of this effectively. Lisa, what's on your mind? I mean, I, I just don't think that it's ideological. I think that they learned that single issue voters are easy to turn out on abortion, and so they, they it's easy to force politicians onto a no on that vote because there's no punishment for it because the coalition of folks who are pro-reproductive freedom are smaller and don't mobilize as easily because they don't control the rhetorical frame about them as baby killers. And so I actually, I actually don't think that they care about the life part at all. I think it's, that's entirely about creating blocks of money that they can pour into candidates to buy off um, legislators. So yeah, yeah. I'm, so I, I was actually going to ask the same question as Kelly about union workers because I think a more compelling frame is what would you do if you had an unintended pregnancy in your family right now? I think that's that would be the question that I would ask the union workers. H how would you accommodate an unexpected pregnancy at 42? You know, how would your family absorb the cost of that? What decisions would you make? What would you have to what would you have to cut? What how would you change your family household budget? Would somebody have to get another job? I mean, I would, for me, it's a thought experiment and empathy that is the only real way around the thing. I, I actually, it's not that I don't agree with you that, there, that the, the life argument is hypocrisy. I just don't think pointing out the hypocrisy is the way that you move them on the life issue. I mean, of course, these are matters of, of, Pol of what? Politics. Well, not just politics, but persuasion. And um, because we, 
we are facing the voters themselves, not just those political forces that are using certain issues in certain ways. But we have to recognize that voters, like anyone else, are not just motivated by prudential concerns for what suits their convenience. They are concerned also with ethics, with what is right. And those who are Catholic and traditional and those who are evangelical and towing the line of, of considering the fetus to be a, at least a, a potential person and recognize that that means that we have to, to think differently about uh, abortion. I think we have to address that and not ignore it. And that is something that with this kind of argument, we can remove that ethical opposition because we can show that this is really in accord with their concerns I mean, and completely undercuts the people. That right. argument only works if they do. <laughs> they do, and, and includes women. People, so. There are plenty of women who, who, who they hold. They who also do not, do. yeah, I mean, they're I, all the same people. You have to just concede that part, Richard. If people think that life begins at conception and the fetus is a person and an agency with political rights, that, that you just gotta concede that, because like, the position of pro-abortion is, yes, okay, fine. That's life, women's are life, women's lives are more important. That's the hierarchy. You gotta, you gotta create a hierarchy. Plus, plus, plus abortion is birth control. It's not, it is birth control, it is contraception. And so I, I appreciate that like, we need to reduce the number of unwanted pregnancies, but women are still gonna get pregnant. <laughs> They're still gonna have unwanted pregnancies. And I worry that if you don't say abortion is birth control, it's part of that healthcare, that the women who still need abortions after we've done, after the revolution, which I'm all for, I'm here for that, become even more, <sighs> or like they become Margin. more marginalized mm -hmm. because we, we keep saying like, abortion's not this great thing, so we're trying to just get rid of it. It's always gonna be there. But there's a big block of, especially in the black community, a big block of Democratic voters who are actually not, don't like abortion. They don't, they are only like, they are very uncomfortable and actually want abortion numbers. They don't want it to be birth control. They, sure. uh, and so there's a way in which we on the, whatever we are on the left, uh, need to articulate a more like robust argument of like enabling freedom for women. That's more than just like women can do whatever they want with their bodies. That, that has like, what does it actually mean to like change the content of our choices? So I'm not stuck with on the one hand, like a uh, pregnancy, like an unwanted kid or an unwanted abortion, uh, where we're actually making the options, you know, a kid I want if I want to get pregnant and you know, if I get pregnant when I don't want to, I don't have to have this kid if I don't want to. Uh, and we create the avenues for that to actually be, if I have a kid, I have the enabling conditions, like not go bankrupt. Uh, and if, if I get pregnant and I don't want a kid, I have the enabling conditions to like not have the kid if I don't want to. That we're actually creating pathways that are... Sure, it's just yeah, the rhetorical yeah. choices you make for that now yeah. might set the stage later for the marginalization of women who are still going to get pregnant even when they're using right. other kinds of birth control. So that's okay. just, I'm yeah, just thinking okay, like long term, right. like mm -hmm. the, the discourse that you set now might have unintended consequences. But. Okay, I get what you're saying. But, but, but I think it does yeah. show I, that the fetus killers are the pro-choice who want to ban abortion, not those who are standing up for reproductive freedom. And I think that can be, be shown very convincingly. And that changes the whole rhetorical situation. Uh, you're talking just in terms of like the number of abortions that will happen uh, will decrease versus just go underground. I just don't think they care. Yeah. I think the dead woman is the point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so I, I, I that's the point. It's the point. Is like if we ban abortion mm -hmm. and then the poor women die on the table, that is the point. The cruelty is the point. The point is not the abortions. Yeah. yeah. It's not we are trying it's, to punish poor women. It's the for eugenics. Being, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the eugenics of the poor. That is the point. It's not the actual the abortion is like the shiny object. Don't chase the shiny object. The thing is about what the policy fundamentally produces. 
So this is why I'm saying, like, I agree that the hypocrisy of the life argument is trash. They don't care about the baby after it's born. Personhood only matters while well. it's a political football that you can mobilize for single issue voters. Mm -hmm. But 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 I, I just for me it's like how do we change the terms of debate so that they're forced to consider the effect on them? I think you're talking here about the people who are using it for their political purposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I but the people themselves who believe mm -hmm. that the fetus is something that has rights mm -hmm. and object to abortion yeah. is a significant part of America and, and the electorate that we have to deal with. And we have to persuade them that their opposition to abortion is, in some respect, inconsistent with their very own principles. Yeah. Well, I have to wonder, too, the importance of the fact that on your platform, you are saying abortion on demand and publicly funded, and that's huge. Yeah. That, it creates a different understanding of it as a public good so I think that's really, really important. So even if I might think the rhetorical strategy is flawed, I think that is really, really important. And I appreciate that very much about your, your platform and not just the, we need access, like whatever that means, so. Other thoughts or questions? because I haven't done research recently on black Democrats. Mm -hmm. What is the age range in, in particular about black Democrats thinking that they, they don't support abortion? Because I'm very in, in, interested in that just because of black respectability mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if it's older black women, older black men who are talking about I don't support abortion, that's a respectability thing. And I'm with Dr. Corrigan when a family is presented with a young daughter being pregnant. And if I go to that black family and I'm, we're, we're having a converse, conversation and I'm like, hey, listen, are y'all gonna be able to support this child realistically mm -hmm. with the resources you have? Yeah. And so I think rhetorically we need to think about, when we think about marginalized people, black women in particular, as me being a black feminist scholar, mm -hmm. And rhetoric, I'm thinking about okay, your respectability politics, and this is a historical thing mm -hmm. with black women. They sometimes get into into the way of practicality of a decision, and sometimes you can't support that child even though you want that child badly. Mm -hmm. So we need to be asking more questions about not to make black mothers feel shame, none of that, but having some kind of support system for marginalized women like to help them make these decisions. Because we, because people are like, well, we want them to have the babies, but I'm like thinking, well, how much does that cost? I come from a family where my mom was a black, black woman on welfare for a very long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I am grateful that I'm here and I'm grateful she made the decision to keep me and my sister and my brother. But I saw the strain, the financial, the so expensive. <laughs> yeah, and so you already know, have marginalized women that are poor. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about the message we send. Like you have these babies, but we don't support, especially in certain communities, we don't provide the financial support for those women mm -hmm. to care for those children. And it's even hard enough for people who got money to care for their child. Yeah. So yes. I, it's a conversation yeah. that has a lot of nuances. And that's, that's why I'm bringing mm -hmm. that out. Yeah. But no, remember, I, we don't have to accept that framework, that reality. Mm -hmm. We can immediately implement guaranteed jobs at fair wages and have equivalent replacement income, have free public child care and elder care, have single payer health care. Have various forms of rent stabilization and so forth, ban eviction foreclosures, child allowances. Into us, child allowances. We can completely transform that situation. And of course, that means we're in a different rhetorical world. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Yeah. 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 So, the last, um, another piece that you yeah. sort of transitioning to sort of the, the labor uh, job as aspect of things, um, you. I've also talked a lot about the persistent uh, gap in income, uh, wealth, and power between men and women. Yeah. So would you talk a little bit yeah. about that? Again, I think that what it is that under, under, underlies the persistence of this gap 
in income, wealth, retirement benefits, and power, both economic and political, despite 100 years of women's suffrage, despite 50 years of equal pay for equal work legislation, despite decades of uh, sort of juridical practice, thanks to Ruth Bader Ginsburg and others, where the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause has been applied to, to gender and not just race and so forth. Uh, you know, we, we want to really ask, why is that the case? And what are the remedies? Um, uh, first of all, regarding the issue of whether uh, of um, the discrepancy in income and wealth of women, um, and why it hasn't been solved by laws of equal pay for equal work. I mean, first of all, there's a question of enforcement. And the fact that people don't have access to legal representation in civil cases means that they're not in a position to attempt to, to be able to enforce that law. But it's not just a question of enforcing that law. Because as we all know, there are whole parts of uh, the labor market and occupations that predominantly employ women, where everyone in that occupation is paid poorly and is fairly dis <laughs> disempowered. Yeah, equal pay doesn't care and, and equal pay for equal work is not going to change that situation. Well, I'm pay you like shit. And right. you know, we, we know we're talking about health care aides, we're talking about teachers in the public schools, mm -hmm. we're talking about retail clerks, you know, we're talking about people who do domestic work, custodians, and so forth and so on. Um, so we have to recognize that that is um, a major part of the problem. And we're, we're talking about both low wages and employee disempowerment. The other thing is that you know, a, a clear and I think essential part for this persistence of gap in pay, wealth, and power is the fact that we have not balanced work and family and have done so more poorly than other developed nations. And we've made it a situation where the situation of women, both in those who give birth and those who are ending up having to care for children and elders disproportionately as they do today, cannot earn and pursue their careers or participate politically and, and obtain leadership positions because of our failure to balance work in the family that will remove those problems. You know, we, and I think that is a key measure for why there is this persistence. Uh, despite these efforts to uh, achieve these rights, and also even affirmative action. Mm -hmm. So again, I think there are remedies um, to be had. I mean, first of all, if you're going to talk about enforcing equal pay for equal work, it is important to have legal care for all, so that people can fight for their rights on the job and for any kind of discrepancy. Secondly, we need to have universal unionization at every workplace, so that those low-paying occupations can cease to be low-paying occupations. And part of doing that is, of course, having a fair minimum wage that goes up to keep pace with national productivity. But we want more than that. We want to have a, uh, a viable uh, worker solidarity and seats on corporate boards. And when you have full employment, by the way, with a federal job guarantee, you have the tightest labor market, which allows workers to be able to fight to increase their wages have better hours and so forth, because they're not facing an army of the unemployed breathing down their necks. But then we also have to have the, the kind of measures I discussed earlier. We have to have paid family leave. And by the way, family leave is not something that just pertains to medical questions. It has to pertain to, for example, being able to accompany your kids to a school conference or to a court or to anything involving things that have to be done you know, for your children and family dependents. And then, of course, we need free public child and elder care. Yeah, yeah. And child allowances, finally. So that, indeed, uh, no one's family uh, obligations and entanglements are in any way going to hinder their opportunities, their pursuit of a career, their retention of seniority privileges, or their ability to participate in political life is going to be handicapped by their situation. 
And I think these are, these are crucial measures that we have failed to institute. And I think they are a major cause of why there, there remains this gap. And we have the resources to, to remove them, to remove these problems. Yeah. I think what's interesting too is that if the policy is done right and I, it's in this gender neutral way, it really, I think the evidence from the Northern European countries, um, where they're very happy, although there's also a very high CD study rate, I'm not sure what to make of that, but the- Dark and cold. Yeah, right, <laughs> it's the dark and cold, so if you don't give it, you're still you're really happy, but the, um, those policies ended up transforming gender roles in the family. Um, oh, and it was like a big transformation, but it showed the influence that policy can have because it ended up in a way providing a cover. There was an expectation yes. it wasn't just women yes. taking advantage of these things um, or, or men selectively and then using that as like a daddy bonus or something. Um, so, yes. Yeah, and of course, this applies to, to partners who are not heterosexual, who have whatever identity we're talking about. Uh, sure. But one thing regarding the Scandinavian nations, you know, where, well, there may be higher rates of suicide, yeah. and of course there, there's, there's a growth of fascist movements in these yes. countries, yeah. despite the fact that they have much more generous social opportunities than we have, but they do not have a guaranteed job program. <coughs> so as they become a magnet for people who are refugees and immigrants to come into these nations, there are sectors of the population who are worried about being jobless or having wages depressed. And I think if the, the absence of a guaranteed job program, fair wages, et cetera, and, and universal unionization mm -hmm. is something that would go a long way to remedy this kind of resurgence of fascism there and elsewhere in the world. Yeah, I, I mean, one, I want to reiterate how important the sting out of xenophobia in the United States would take away if we, if we had a federal job guarantee. Yeah, they would still be like ethno-nationalists, but it wouldn't be deep. It, no, it would, it would yeah. be superficial to be able to be um, punctured. So if you really want to get out of, if you really want to get at xenophobia, mm -hmm. the federal job guarantee, I think, I think is a muscular um, approach. But also, people will balk at the notion that we can have a legal care for all on the model of Medicare for all. But they're both prestige positions. And if we can figure out how to do it with doctors, we can figure out how to do it with lawyers. And I do think, insofar as that's a reasonable ask, like that we have a single payer um, healthcare in, in industry, that we can have a single payer legal care industry. And we just need to point to the fact that you can't have a nation of laws, but restrict access to lawyers uh, to those who are wealthy versus, and those who have the charity of those who are wealthy, right? So like the legal aid and legal ease where well, all rights are secured by someone else's charity, then they're not rights, it's someone else's charity. So I, I think it's a good model, and if we can do it in medicine, we can do it in law, in, in legal care, because they're both prestige positions and, so, and the mechanisms would work similarly. But it's also that we're facing a massive doctor shortage and a massive lawyer shortage, especially in yes. rural states. So, I mean, the advantage of that is saying there are going to be more positions available for both doctors yeah. and lawyers, yeah. which would help boost, you yeah. know, it would retain people in the rural states where they're brain draining out. It yeah. would professionalize rural states. Yeah. I mean, I think that there is a tremendous political appeal to saying we're going to professionalize the working class of our state yeah. in ways that really create beneficial structures for everybody. I think that's a good art. Especially if there's so the problem with access. If the decrease in lawyers and medical providers is because of student loan debt, yeah. but if we're talking about actual education being funded, then you don't have to pick between like going to medical school and like living a life. But yeah. on the other end of that, even if costs continue in higher ed, we haven't talked about that, and I'm sure you have a plan, but even if that's the case, then here you have all of this, you know, both federal subsidy yeah. and demand to help match the loan structure, mm -hmm. which doesn't then deplete higher ed from the fund, but it's making up from federal government decreasing and matching mm -hmm. the funding. And, and if you open up civil representation oh, yeah. as something where lawyers will know they'll be paid. Yeah, it's not it's because currently it's not like people can't pay for it. That's right. That's going to allow them to be able to make a living that's hot. everywhere. That's, that's hot for the trial lawyers, too. I mean, I think that they would be interested in, in this structure. I mean, what? what? Oh, yeah, go ahead. So, okay. and by all means, I think it's totally upon the, the head of, of the, the wealth of its 
security that's baked into our system. But that system didn't bumble along into the state that we have right now. This is a design system. You, th this is a design scarcity of legal resources. This is an architected, non-disclosure, non-compete uh, society that we've uh, entered into, and it's all been so that we have two systems of legalities, two systems of security in this country. Uh, and I, I guess what I'm curious about is how, how are you going to be able to um, find enough political will to overcome what is the systematic design of the people who are in charge of us at this point? Uh, I mean, you need to sell a story that they spend countless <coughs> of effort and money selling to the populace. Uh, we're not getting less right-to-work states. We've been getting more right-to-work states. Uh, the whole point of a non-complete non agreement isn't so that you actually keep an employee from going off and giving the talent that you might have raised in them. It's to bankrupt that employee if he steps out of line. Those, those non-complete agreements don't really succeed the only thing they succeed in is that the guy with the bigger lawyer will bankrupt the person without the lawyer. So how do you overcome that when the implicit threat of pushing back against the system is a risk unto itself, and that all of the resources of the messaging that is out there in society about what is better for us, this system that they've created, how do you overcome that with political will when there's so many participants inside of it that believe that this is the better system? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have an impoverished view of what our rights are, which is founded in the impoverished character of our Constitution, which does not mention or acknowledge, let alone call for the enforcement of any of our social rights, yeah. including the true right to work at fair wages, mm -hmm. you know, the right to uh, unionization, you know, the right to balance work and family, the right to health care, the right to decent housing, the right to education, which is not mentioned in our Constitution, uh, and, and the right to legal representation, not just in criminal, but civil. So I think we have to challenge this very narrow view of freedom that has been by and large accepted. And I think it has, I mean, it has come up at very specific historical junctures where, you know, we've had all these struggles to try to have what rights are in our Constitution be applied in a way that is consistent, instead of having them applied, as we know they were from the beginning, as rights that only applied to white males, heterosexual, who had property. And so two centuries have, of various civil rights struggles have been underway to try to have the rights applied to everyone. But every time these successes have been achieved, it's been recognized that those successes are not enough to remove the inequities that people face, both owing to race and gender and economic position and so forth. And so you had Roosevelt calling for a social bill of rights just when we were defeating fascism. And we knew that the freedoms we had at least were safe, but Roosevelt said they're not enough. Martin Luther King, after the success of the civil rights movements, uh, voting acts, voting, Rights Act, civil rights legislation, so forth, call for a new campaign. Again, to fulfill these same social rights with the Poor People's Campaign. Of course, none of these were mentioned, not listened to. And here we are 50 years later, but with I think a growing recognition that you know, racial and gender disadvantage remain entrenched. We are becoming more and more unequal in terms of wealth and income. Uh, we're not at all dealing with the climate emergency we're facing. And we're not really tackling the growing I think you could call it a fascist movement in our country and elsewhere. It's threatening everything. So I think there's enough of a sense about these limitations, these problems, and what the solution could be for there to be hope that the 2020 elections could transform the political situation in a way where, where some of these things can actually be implemented with popular support. I don't think that's completely uh, a utopian view. I think it's interesting that the, the couple of, of points that you point out as points in history when it comes to attempts is not successful. But they're 
also points of a rising, strengthening economy, right? So most of the success that you see uh, in socialistic programs being placed inside of America is when we have an economic downturn of significant proportion. Uh, at least it's our best chance. And I would put forth to you that maybe that time's coming very soon. <laughs> Um, so maybe that is your opportunity to make the argument. One, uh, when talking about the, the gap in pay, in the equal pay for equal work, um, and, and some of those initiatives, uh, I have always been, as someone who always did sort of low wage work, like cleaning, janitor, like janitorial type, um, types of things, I find the push for equal pay, equal work to be very classist in the sense that it's it's pushing for high wage white women to get paid the same as the high wage white men that ends up getting weaponized against low wage workers in the sense that, so for example, I used to work in a, um, I was a janitor and uh, the equal pay for equal work stuff like passed and then we couldn't do gender jobs. So then you had these like older, like middle class women hauling these like huge machines like up staircases to like wax floors because it was like we can't discriminate for like when everyone has to do the same work and be paid the same for the same stuff and instead of like you fold the beds and you wax the floors um, in a way that ends up getting making labor harder for for women working low wage jobs because it uh, what the labor used to be divided like physical labor with you and you vacuum the floors and wash, wash the windows or whatever um, in a way that like white women pushing for like this like ended up weaponizing against like women working like these jobs uh, and so I guess the, the comment on, on that is um, we have to be careful especially as white people and white women in particular pushing for an agenda that we think is making lives better for women but is not accounting for like the huge, huge population of, of working class, black and brown, and low wage working women, who that gets weaponized against. Um, and I don't, I don't know, th thoughts on that in terms of? Well, again, you know, the situation you're speaking about mm -hmm. is a situation where, first of all, we accept <coughs> low wages, yeah. poverty <laughs> wages, yes. Yes. and that reflects the fact that we're accepting massive disempowerment of employees yeah. who are not unionized, and that can have something to say with what kind of work assignments one gets, if one is you know, able to do them or not able to do them, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but, I but I think, of, I mean, in, in, in many fields of work, not just the elite fields of work, um, there can be certain kinds of, um, let's say, scheduled pay increments or ways of rising to a somewhat higher status and if you have to take off from work because you're pregnant or raising a child, you don't have any accommodations for family leave and so forth, you then can't maintain your seniority mm -hmm. um, and things of this sort, and you're going to end up with lower pay, and you're not going to rise to positions of authority or whatever else. And of course, you're not going to be able to participate in, in politics and governing unless yeah. these things are available. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer it. Initiatives that, per, that push for equal pay for comparable work, yeah. uh, in part because the idea that you shouldn't gender anything ends up be, ends up being weird. Uh, you don't want unjust distinctions; you want just distinctions. So, like, I, you know, I don't want to say that like nothing can be gendered or else it's yeah. bad, because then I end up it ends up being like yeah. weaponized in a way that's harmful. And in, instead of like figuring out what are the just ways to to, to you know this is comparable work to this and should yeah. be paid and everyone. Like there should be no gendering of anything, and there should be no because that's bad in a way that, that erases important distinctions. For I mean, work. Socrates raised this question right. when he's discussing uh, whether all occupations in, in, mm -hmm. in the, the just uh, city should be open to women, <laughs> and, he, and he makes the argument: no, there should be no restrictions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's true that certain occupations may require greater physical force and so forth. And uh, mm -hmm. it may be that by and large men are bigger and have a certain type of strength mm -hmm. than women do, but nonetheless there are women who are stronger than men. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason there's no way of saying that certain occupations 
have to be confined to one gender or another. And so, similarly in these cases, right? You have certain requirements to do that job. And uh, if you can do it, you do it. But on the other hand, you have a guaranteed job awaiting you, so even if you can't do that job, yeah, exactly. there'll be some other job. Exactly. And there's no reason to think that uh, yes. those jobs that require that kind of particular qualification should be paid more mm -hmm. than the other jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we are. Well, one thing that uh, that gentleman raised was how do you change the mindset of people, and you said that there is hope, but you know yourself. Uh, in the duration of your campaigning, uh, that that uh, hope is uh, pretty much impeded in a very significant way with the money in politics, right? So you have people who get their message out, uh, if they have one, most people don't. Uh, they're able to do so because um, they have more money and uh, or they are uh, out there because of their identities. Uh, but for people who do have a message, or anybody who doesn't have the money, you know, what is the way that you get your message out? And uh, that's a big problem I see. And how do you get the populace at large who are interested in these ideas and who do want change to actually come out and support yeah. such candidates? You know, how do you get people not to be lazy? How do you get people to just press on that button and like a person or share a message? Uh, you know, that's the big challenge of. Um, um, well, I mean, you know, that you're facing. Job guarantees so that there's media infrastructure yeah. in place, or rural, rural like communication infrastructure is. Yeah, I mean, but, but I think rhetoric is all, all very well, but how do you, uh, who do you employ it against, and where's the time and place to do it? Look, I mean, I mean, I do think, contrary to some remarks we made before, that <clears throat> we can persuade people to change their their views. But to do so, we have to be able to engage them in a, in a significant discussion mm -hmm. that has to go beyond sound bites mm -hmm. or the repetition ad nauseum of a, of a stump speech <laughs> to which politicians seem to be largely restricted. And I think any of us who are professors or have been teachers, I think we know we can change the thinking of students because we have them in our in our grasp as, as discussants yeah. over an extended period of time, we may never be able to change the thinking of our colleagues. We don't bother to read what we write, right. but we hardly ever discuss things at, at any great length. But students, we can do it. But the same thing applies to the public. One has to have the chance to do that. Mm -hmm. And given how money controls our, uh, our political process to a great extreme, mm -hmm. it is very difficult to have that opportunity. And it depends upon people um, maybe relying upon a free press that might, might at times cover things without having to pay for the coverage. Social media that might provide some options to look at things if it can be you know, retweeted and shared and so forth sufficiently. But that is a huge challenge. And um, you can sort of understand why sort of Democratic Party playbook is to get out the vote of the Democrats and not try to engage in any kind of persuasion of those who hold other views. Um, you know, there's a certain pragmatic um, applicability of that, but on the other hand, I think one has to make the case to a broader public. But then it's difficult to get the opportunity. Um, I think we have some candidates who are making cases that haven't been made before, and hopefully will have a chance to make their case um, at length the public will see. I'm under the radar myself. I'm not getting much attention. Um, so I need support. I need those who will retweet whatever may come up and spread the word. And hopefully things will be, certain positions will be noticed. You know, I don't, I don't relish being a voice in the wilderness, uh, but that's what I am currently, <laughs> to a large degree. And of course, it's really, really difficult to raise money. <clears throat> to raise money, get anyone to even donate a few bucks. Um, so that's the other thing that you know how to get people to realize that this is all. It's for the public good, mm -hmm. and that everyone surely can come up with three bucks, and that grassroots support. So it's a whole huge enterprise, I think, changing people's minds.
recently went to a uh, conference, Professional Women in Healthcare, um, and there, um, there were CEOs of medical corporations, distributors, talking about how debunking the idea that women are paid less. And I realized that this person who said that, he really is looking for an answer. He's looking to justify the fact that his corporation possibly does not pay women fairly, at least not in the past. But I think that he really is looking for education and answers. And I think human resource departments in these large corporations are recycling their own public relations material and they don't really have the information that would come from the academic world to really help them understand how is it, for example, that something like medical discrimination keeps circulating, keeps yeah. happening. There's nothing to disrupt the pattern. Yeah. And so you said as, you know, as professors, we change people's minds because we teach them. Is there a way particularly since you are under the radar, to put together some, some neutral looking academic material, but you know, accessible, and make an effort to reach out to corporations with huge human resources departments to try to plant some seeds of a new way of thinking that helps people recognize that discrimination happens when they don't see it. The obvious facts that in corporations such as the one you're referring to, they're going to be at least um, certainly on average disproportionately few women oh, yes. at higher levels as you go. Oh, yes. Disproportionately few women as doctors compared to the number of women who are nurses yeah. and medical assistants and so forth. Yeah. And I, I think you can see that it's not just a matter of discriminatory attitudes. Um, I think it has to do with how uh, these various occupations operate from a starting point where, for example, the, indus the industries where women are concentrated are low wage because women had far fewer opportunities to enter other professions. And for that reason, they could be paid less. Um, and so there is a, you know, for example, in teaching, in public school teaching, there's a so-called wage gap between teachers as a whole and people of comparable training in other fields. Um, so there's that which is carried over because we, have, we don't have employee empowerment. As you go up the ladder in whatever profession it is, there are obstacles. If you are a woman who has extra family entanglements and responsibilities, um, partly because of attitudes of your partner, if that's the case, but also because of policies pertaining to uh, paid leave yeah. and things of this sort. And I think those are, those are factors um, that uh, have to be exposed and, and to think about the, the solutions. Mm -hmm. And the solutions are there. Now, in terms of something that can be presented, I, I have a book actually about to come up in nice. later this month, I think, <laughs> called Cannot Democracy your book. Unchained, which is, there's a little bit of philosophy, not a huge amount. It's fairly accessible, but it's for, you know, an audience that is, that is educated. I wouldn't say it's a completely popular popular, but it presents a lot of facts and it, it tries to present policies in all of the different areas of our social rights. And uh, look for it towards the end of the month. Hopefully it will be. No, but the, what, what about the point of presenting it to corp, uh, corporations? Well, that's, that, that's something that the, can be done, right? Well, the problem is. I don't think you're going to get this from the top. Yeah. No one won't. I mean, well, I would say no one, but uh, I don't think any corporations are particularly interested in hearing anything from me, or as much of anyone else, for that matter. <laughs> my then why not try the corporation? Maybe that'll change, but. Yeah. And I think that's part of why yeah. the corporate 
world controls so much. Yeah. And that relations need to be built there. And, and, and they, they, they're human resources departments. Yeah. They, have, they have goals they have to make. Yeah. And they don't know how to make them. And so they yeah. just keep recycling the same crap when there's an opportunity to inject some real information yeah. that could actually help them reach their goals yeah. without them even realizing that, oh, wow, these are democratic ideals. You know? Yeah. think about the situation would be different um, <clears throat> if you had unionization oh. at these things and people on the, on the corporate boards. Now that's not going to happen by educating them, it'll happen yeah. if at all. Well, I do want to be mindful of people's time. I'll let y'all go have lunch. Thank, Thank you so much.